microphone. It is a pleasure. It is a pleasure to bring back to re, uh, to have back on the program the uh, Princeton and, and not the I guess a but for me the Princeton uh, professor of history on his uh, new book Burning Down the House Newt Gingrich the Fall of a Speaker and the Rise of a New Republic of the New Republican Party Julian Zelizer welcome back to the program thanks for having me Sam great to be with you. So, uh, Newt Gingrich. Now, I got to say, um, I have the book here. Uh, I, I, you know, I knew a little bit of Newt. I've been uh, following his career for quite some time, obviously. And um, there was a lot of stuff in here I didn't realize. Let's, I, I want to, I mean, I want to, I want to, I want to broaden this out. I mean, this is a book really about, uh, in many respects, about personalities. But I do ultimately want to broaden it out a little bit. But uh, just tell us, um, I did not realize, and I'm really uh, hurt by this, that I didn't realize this, that he married his own math, uh, his, his, his high school math teacher. Um, and uh, I knew everything else about how he ditched her uh, when she had cancer. But tell us, give us a little bit about just like his, his bio. I, and I, I think I had forgot that he became a congressman uh, as early as 1978. So just uh, uh, give us a little bit of where he's coming from. Yeah, this guy, he, I mean, he was born in Harrisburg, right outside Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, working class, conservative area. Uh, his dad, his biological dad, left his mom uh, while uh, she was pregnant. And he grew up uh, with his stepdad, who was in the military, as an army brat. So he moved around Europe, lived in many different places until they finally settled in Georgia. Uh, and in high school, in, in late high school, he starts uh, dating uh, secretly his high school math teacher. And when he goes to Emory after high school, uh, she goes with him and she gets a job there and, and they will get married. And uh, his personal life starts in, in a bit of a turmoil situation. His stepfather disapproved of this. Um, Gingrich gets a PhD in history at Tulane. He gets a job in West Georgia College, but he doesn't want to be an academic. And so he runs for Congress in 74 and 76 against an old Southern Dixiecrat, uh, Congressman John Flint. And then finally, Flint retires. And in 1978, he wins in a pretty blistering campaign against someone named Virginia Shepard. Yeah. Now, I want to talk about uh, how he won that race against. Um, um, but but let's just talk about like his impetus to become a, a, a congressman, because the thing about Gingrich is he doesn't seem to care. Like, you know, there has been some of the biggest right wing personalities I feel don't really seem to care that much about conservative policy in any uh, fashion. You know, like I'm thinking like, like a guy like uh, like Breitbart, for instance, who couldn't you could he there wasn't a single policy that he would advocate. He was just it was all for him. It was about this sort of culture on some level. And and Gingrich sort of like seems to have some of that. He almost like uses policy uh, in the way that some people use culture. He 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 just wants power. Like how much insight do you have as to like what motivated him to become a congressman? Because it sort of feels like he want, he wanted that idea of being a, uh, an academic where he gets to tell, you know, talk to, you know, has an audience every day in terms of his class, but then he didn't want to do the work. Yeah. I mean, he's a, uh, until the mid seventies, even the first time he runs for the house seat, he's really a Rockefeller Republican. He's not particularly committed to, you know, a set of conservative ideas. He believes the Republican party should be a broad coalition. He loved Nixon before Watergate because he thought that's exactly what Nixon was doing. And it's only in the mid seventies, he starts to associate with the right wing conservative movement that's taking form. Uh, look, broadly, he does accept the importance of tax cuts and deregulation and a strong defense. But within that, he's pretty flexible. And I think even though we think of him as this big ideas politician and he likes to present himself that way, the professor politician, really, he's exactly what you're saying. He's about getting power for the Republican Party and figuring out how to do that. That's been his central theme throughout his career. 
uh, rather than as a fierce ideology. The ideology, the policies, that's all in service of his partisan strategy. And all right, so talk about that first election that he wins, because that seems to be uh, largely a template for how he's going to do everything. Yeah, he runs against uh, someone named Virginia Shepard, who is in the state government. And she's actually a moderate Democrat, more conservative than him on a lot of fiscal issues. So he needs to figure out in 1978 how to basically uh, take her down. And at one moment, she says to a reporter that if she wins, she'll move to Washington and her family will stay in the district. Her husband had a job and she didn't see any need that he had to, to lose that. So Gingrich just picks up on that. He hones right in on that statement. And he basically, he doesn't basically, he says she's going to break up her family for her professional aspirations. And she's uh, a radical because of this. And every campaign stop after that, he appears with his family surrounding him and makes himself the family uh, values candidate as a way to remind voters uh, of what he's saying about her. And it's, it's a pretty brutal campaign. The Shepard uh, campaign uh, people are just taken aback that he's doing this, but it works. He wins the seat. And, and I mean that he's running, I mean, it's a, it, it is, it becomes a template for, for the modern Republican party in many respects. Right. I mean, like I, I, that they, they, they did that to Hillary Clinton shortly, you know, right. I don't know how many years later it was, I guess, uh, to, you know, f- 15 years later, uh, that became the issue with Hillary Clinton, that she was, you know, not going to stay in the kitchen. Well, yes, that's exactly right. And, and Gingrich is a storyteller. I mean, he believes that from the start, the way to win in politics is to tell the story that sticks in the media and to make of your opponents uh, a caricature. And if it's well done, it's hard for them to undo and that the media will suck it up if it's done in blistering fashion. And so he, he does that particular template uh, with her and, and he'll continue with the Hillary Clinton. And then with Democrats, you know, he, he makes them into this corrupt establishment uh, that has absolutely no intrinsic value and is, is lining its pockets. And he's very good at putting people into that portrait. Um, let's, uh... Let's talk about, okay, so he's, he comes in in 78, uh, of course, uh, Ronald Reagan um, uh, becomes elected in 1980. What, um, he, he goes on to uh, basically set up, I don't know, with this, is it like the, were there a lot of caucuses before this? He sets up like basically like his, you know, a, a prototype, it seems like uh, for the Freedom Caucus in a way. Yeah, caucuses are just taking form in the 70s, really. Um, The Congressional Black Caucus is one of the first big ones. There's something called the Democratic Study Group. uh, And and they're just starting to sprout. And he creates his own, the Conservative Opportunity Society, which is a small group of uh, Republicans like him who were as critical of their own leadership as they were the Democrats. And we're saying the party had to do anything, basically. They had to go there to win. And we have to remember the House of Representatives had been controlled by Democrats since 1954. So in their minds, unless the party was willing to be much more radical in its tactics, the GOP would forever be a minority party. So this group, the Congressional, the COS, as a shorthand, becomes his his team. They are his allies. And through them, he starts to conduct his wars. I mean, this is the thing that I think is really sort of fascinating is that it is, again, it is structured around this idea of how to win as opposed to what to win. That's true. Uh, I mean, I I think that's really important in terms of understanding him. Uh, A lot of the story that I tell is about him focusing on ethics and why Democrats are unethical, including the Speaker of the House. While he's doing this, he is accused all the time of unethical behavior, and he's being investigated for it. He doesn't care deep down about a lot of the issues that he focuses on. They are a means to an end, and it's about the winning. And uh, if there's a way to understand the Gingrich mentality through today in the GOP, it's partisanship above all else, including governance, including the needs of the institution. And you always make that the priority in what you're doing. And that also means a lot of your ideas and principles, they're flexible. And you'll move to the one that's more useful for you. Uh, Hence, uh, burning down the house, 
<laughs> um, that, that's exactly right. A song that you know provides the perfect title, and that is what he wanted to do. He, he didn't believe there was an incremental way to defeat the Democrats. You had to take them down, uh, and you also had to take down the institution as it operated. You had to change the basic rules of of politics, and and that's what he set out to do. And so, okay, so one of his um, one of his targets uh, early on was actually. Um, or I guess maybe the, the focus of his ire uh, was a guy named Bob Michael, who was the, and, and people should, I, I should remind people, the Democrats controlled the house from, for about what, 40 some odd years more. Yeah. Since 1954. So, so they, they controlled it from 54 until 90, uh, 95, I guess it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so uh, people have to understand it in that context that the, in many respects, the, the Democrats had ossified it, 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 you know, as far as I can recall. Uh, and there was, you know, a, there was a real sort of like transactional quality to everything. Right. And, and there was a lot of like sort of um, good old boy quality to all of it, it, it seems to me. And, Gingrich came in and he had a real problem with Bob Michael, who was the minority leader of the Republicans. I mean, was this was this is this like an anti-establishment thing or is this more like, you know, I don't know. uh, Here's the new boss, same as the old boss type of situation. Well, the anti-establishment rhetoric was something Gingrich is very deliberate about this. And he argued this is the rhetoric Republicans have to use. Uh, in the aftermath of Watergate and Vietnam, there was a lot of distrust in this country. A lot of it had been focused on Republicans. But he says, let's turn it on the Democrats. Let's use this as the main argument to go after the Democratic Party. And they had been in power so long. Everything you said is true. And so they were vulnerable. And he thought that was a much more effective kind of rhetoric than even liberal versus conservative, right versus left, establishment versus anti-establishment almost capitalize on the ethos of the 60s and use it against the party of liberalism. But that also meant going after Republicans like Bob Michael, who were comfortable in the system, uh, who believed still in the importance of governing and being able to make decisions and pass legislation. But he was going to have to change their way or even take them down eventually if his style was going to win. So he's, he's known in the 80s as a guy who's just as dangerous to his own party as he is to the Democrats. Um, and, and so I think, I, I, again, it's, it's a tactic, but it's a tactic based on some truth uh, that he sensed in how Washington worked. You know, um, that, that, that the, the, the notion of his anti-establishmentarianism, I guess, coming out of the 60s, um, that story about, um, what was it called? Um, uh, cam scam. Yeah. Um, cam scam reminded me of like something that Abby Hoffman would have done. You know what I mean? Like there was some, there was a, there was a yippy quality to that. Um, I mean, obviously there's a lot of, but, but like just the ability of like, we're going to make the system work on itself. Uh, like it reminded me in, in some way of like going into wall street and throwing, uh, and throwing cash everywhere. But, but just, uh, tell us that story. Cause it's, it's, I think it shows how, media savvy and how much he knew uh, this was really about um, how to tell a story. Yeah, I mean, in 1984, he, he and this group, uh, COS, they're trying to figure out a way to get known and get their message out. And then he says, you know, there's this channel called C-SPAN that had been created in 1979 when the House finally allowed cameras to cover what they were doing. It was a sunshine reform, throw light onto Washington. And what Gingrich and his allies do is they, they go uh, on the floor at the end of every day when any member, even someone who doesn't have power, is allowed to make a short one-minute speech. And they started making a speech every single day at the end, end of the day. And the speeches were blistering. They were attacking Democrats for being weak on defense, saying the whole party didn't really care about the security of this country. They weren't supporting Reagan's war against communism in Central America. And it got even worse as the speeches progressed. They started calling out specific Democrats and saying, is this all true about you? And why don't you respond? 
And if you were watching C-SPAN, you saw no one respond. It, it looked like the Democrats had zero answers to the charge. Uh, but what you couldn't see because the camera only showed the person speaking was that the chamber was 100% empty. There was no one there. Uh, and, and it was a kind of Abby Hoffman-like political theater, but carried out on a national stage on this new medium of cable television. And the story progresses. Speaker Tip O'Neill gets so mad he comes in and he orders the cameras to show the chamber so that viewers could see this is all just not true. It's a kind of a made up uh, a situation. And even then Gingrich turns it on him and he says, look at the speaker, he's violating the rules which say, say you can't sh show the chamber. He's an autocrat, he's a, you know, tyrannical. He, he kind of quickly uses that and gets that rhetoric out there. And then the whole thing ends with O'Neill making this blistering speech about Gingrich saying, this is McCarthyism, it's the lowest thing he's seen in Washington. And the Republicans actually are able to strike uh, the speaker's words from the record and say they were inappropriate. And again, it showed just how far the Democrats are willing to go. Uh, and it all culminates with the networks covering this, meaning Gingrich, who is still pretty unknown, uses this cam scam incident, uses this controversy to get on the national networks, on national newspaper stories, and he had arrived. He gives them conflict and the media can't resist. Uh, and, and that is something he does again and again and again. And and then um, uh, within a couple of years, it's basically, you know, we get to, uh, in many respects, the sort of the pivot point of your book uh, where he, um, uh, not single handedly, but he is the um, he basically goes after um, Jim Wright, who is uh, or I should say. Um, yeah, he goes after Jim Wright. Um, who is the um, uh, the Speaker of the House after Tip O'Neill uh, steps down in 80, 87. Seven. Uh, and um, this is where he basically hones. And, and, and I, you know, I, I was in college at that time. I don't remember, you know, I, I vaguely remember all of it happening. I just wasn't as in, you know, uh, wasn't uh, paying as much attention uh, at the time, but it, it struck me as how effective because I'm quite convinced that although the Iraq war was a very big part of it, the Democrats took back the house in 2006 because of corruption and the, the salience of corruption in that it talk about, uh, about his attack on Jim Wright, but then also talk about this sort of like, you know, historically has corruption always been this effective it is a big issue. I mean, this is a country which was founded uh, not only about fears of centralized power, but also fears of corrupt power. So I think at some level it resonates. Um, and that's how Gingrich then went after Jim Wright. Jim Wright was an old school Democrat. Uh, he had been majority leader for 10 years. He had been pretty tough with Republicans. He, he felt like he was fighting a, a last stand for liberalism, especially in the 1980s. So uh, a lot of Republicans didn't like him so much. Uh, and there have been stories in the national and Texas press about Speaker Wright, about Jim Wright, about some relations he had with business people in his district that seemed a little shady. He had a, a book of speeches, uh, a, a thin little book, but he would sell them in bulk whenever he spoke to big groups. Uh, and it was because you could only earn so much in speaking fees, but you could earn all you want as a legislator through book royalties. And, and what Gingrich did is he took these kinds of stories, which were, they didn't look good, but they, they weren't, you know, another Watergate. But he kept saying, this is the most corrupt speaker in American history. And he took bits and pieces of the stories and blew it up into a kind of scandal frenzy in Washington. Now, and ultimately, the House Ethics Committee starts an investigation uh, and finds that there might be something there. They, they need to keep looking and, and look more seriously. Uh, but the pressure builds so badly before any investigation is done and completed, Wright will resign. And so he uses this fear of corruption, the ethical rules that were put into place after Watergate as a way to reform Washington, and the investigative journalism that was starting to come out also the post Woodward and Bernstein era after Watergate. And he uses all this to again, like in 78, draw a portrait of basically a criminal in the speaker's seat. Uh, and it's pretty devastating. 
All right. Let's talk about, though, the the Democrats reaction, like the way the Democrats handled this, because that this that dynamic where you have and, and we should say uh, Newt Gingrich, every single thing that he accused right of doing or the uh, that came up on ethics, he was doing himself, maybe more. Uh, also, not to mention, you know, like we saw this uh, with um, with the impeachment on some level. So. It is not just it's not a question of there. There's an asymmetry in terms of like, um, you know, how dirty one party or the other was. Uh, But this the way the Democrats reacted and the way the Republicans worked, that dynamic seems to have been like dipped in amber and has existed, it seems to me, up until I'm going to say like maybe 2018. I mean, like, like, talk about their response because I, 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 like, I feel like this, this, this movie plays over and over again. Absolutely. I mean, whenever you focus on an individual who has a big impact, you think about the reactions of the people he worked with. The, the reaction of Republicans in my book is the party leaders embrace him, and even though they say this guy's toxic, it's dangerous, he's a new Joe McCarthy, they say, well, let's let him in the doors and we'll work with him. The reaction of Democrats is is simply not no, they're they're kind of totally caught off guard. Uh, they don't know how to handle him. They don't know what he's up to in the media. They don't know how to really handle the fact that he is he's he's guilty of exactly what he's accusing uh, Jim Wright of. Some would say even worse. At the time, this is all unfolding. I mean, within the months leading into Wright's resignation. There's an investigation, a newspaper report that Gingrich himself had an unethical book deal and he raised money from interest groups to promote the thing. Uh, And he has to have a press conference, several about this. And, um, you know, Gingrich just says it's different, it's not relevant, and the Republicans stand by him. Democrats essentially give up right. They start to put pressure on him to step down. Uh, They start to whisper to the media, I think it's time for him to go. Uh, And so in terms of the resolve of the parties, there's a a difference then that goes through today. Uh, And in terms of what they were willing to do, the Democrats are still more restrained in terms of even how they will go after Gingrich than Gingrich is about going after them. And the parties have not embraced the same kind of partisanship since that period. Uh, Maybe it's changing in 2018, but the party is much more checked as a whole than Republicans who loved what Gingrich did. And they've said, let's just go all out, forget the guardrails and, and let's tear things down. And, and it's an asymmetry uh, through and through. It's, I mean, is from your perspective, is the asymmetry just a function of this dynamic where, you know, ultimately Democrats, you know, uh, there's different uh, sort of like ideologies i think within the democratic party but ultimately they all want government to work in some fashion and conservatives republicans they are happy to have the destruction of government because it's always an impediment you know uh, on some level to to their interests is that is that the only asymmetry I think that's the bit, the most important one. I mean, the the point of the Gingrich story, and certainly someone will probably write it about President Trump, is that when you let partisanship run free and, and when you avoid or eliminate any kind of countervailing uh, thoughts that a politician has, such as I also have to be able to govern, I need to make sure the institutional working and isn't destroyed. When you put those totally aside, and you let partisanship run amok, uh, the threat is that government becomes dysfunctional. And you have two parties with two different philosophies. Democrats, center and left, still all at some level believe in the importance of government, the value of government and government as a first line in dealing with some of the problems we face as a society. So you can't ultimately embrace a level of partisanship will destroy the ability of that government to work. Uh, but Republicans are fine with that, uh, especially as the Republicans have moved rightward. Dysfunction fulfills everything they say about government. It doesn't work. It's not useful. Uh, and so I think that's part of why the parties are different. And 
And then part of it, uh, kind of the impact of leaders from Gingrich to Trump, they have also legitimized, you know, legitimate that kind of thinking within their party. I, I mean, I can't help to, be, I mean, I, I mean, I agree. I think that is a, a big tenant, but I can't help. Like, I, so for instance, in fact, today, Joe Biden has come out and said, I'm open to uh, getting rid of the filibuster for legislation, right? Chris Coons um, uh, said it a couple of weeks ago, which I think was the, uh, which was basically tipping the hand. Chris Coons is, you know, uh, as you know, Biden's one of his top surrogates, maybe his only surrogate. I don't know. Um, and, uh, and, um, and he signaled that he did. Now he signaled that he did, he, he was open to it because it wasn't Bernie Sanders as the nominee, right? Like, I mean, if Bernie Sanders is the nominee, Chris Coons still thinks that as an institutionalist, we need to keep the, um, the, uh, we need to keep the, the filibuster here. So I, I wonder, and I know this is a little bit outside of, uh, of the scope of your book, but you've written a lot of, uh, of, of books about, about Democrats as well, uh, or a lot about Democrats, I should say. Um, um, isn't there also some notion of like the relationship between the bases that, that, that is different between the parties? You know, Chris Coons wants to keep the filibuster if he is equally afraid of and maybe more so afraid of what the left flank of the Democratic Party is going to do without it than he is with what the Republicans will do without it. Well, I think uh, what you're saying at some level is that in the GOP, the base now controls the party. And um, this is also part of the story of the last four decades where the Republicans move much more, not only sharply to the right than Democrats do to the left, but as a whole, they move together. There's just much less division. Democrats are still much more of a divided party, even in this partisan age. And so then some of these tactical considerations are going to be different. And uh, that's exactly what you're arguing uh, with Coons, with Sanders, those divisions just are not really as much of a factor. Everyone's on board in the GOP uh, with with Trump, with Mark Meadows, uh, now chief of staff, before the head of the Freedom Caucus. And when you don't have those divisions, when you are truly uh, party united, I think you're willing to move much farther and take bigger risks um, than you are if you're still divided. And the amazing thing is, I think the Republican Party um, is united simply around power. I mean, I know like this is a, you know, to say that about a, a political party is is incredibly hackneyed. Um, it's said every day on right wing radio. And um, but I mean, Mark Meadows was, like you say, a Freedom Caucus guy, and he has presided over or, you know, at least he's been there for a couple of months. Anyways, he's joined an administration that is um, you know, I have no problem with them spending. I think they should spend more. Uh, but the, the they were they threatened out to shut down the government because of what now amounts to a minuscule deficit relative to what it is now. Like there doesn't seem to be a single principle that they have maintained other than, uh, you know, destruction of government and maybe uh, at the behest of, of wealthy people. Well said, uh, and a fair point. Uh, I mean, I think there are certain threads you could probably see in the party. One is a, a supply side approach to all economic policy. Uh, and I think a general attack on the social safety net. And now you could argue white backlash politics is becoming pretty integral to what the party is about. But But outside of that, I think the principles are hard to uh, they're, they're, they are Gingrich-like in that they are forms of rhetoric rather than genuine policy preferences, fiscal conservatism, family values, all of that you'll hear again and again going into 220, but it doesn't really match a lot of what the party is about. And, and that is related to a party where partisanship is the guiding principle. And if you have that principle, not only are you willing to threaten the institutions of our democracy, you're also willing to go against what you're promising to voters with great ease, uh, with, with amazing ease, uh, because you're not committed to that. You're committed to holding the reins of power. 
Um, let's talk a little bit about, um, uh, you know, go pack. And this is sort of after, um, uh, Gingrich, uh, gets his, his big scalp. Um, and, and, and in the early nineties, he forms this, uh, pack and, uh, I, I mean, I'm really interested in his relationship with Frank Luntz, where that leads to, and also his relationship with talk radio, which really begins to explode after the fairness doctrine. Uh, it, Reagan kills the fairness doctrine and you start to see it really grow. I mean, Limbaugh comes on the scene. I think it was in 88 ish. Um yep. But uh, talk about that because he immediately realizes the value of that. And then we should probably also throw in Atwater because in some ways Atwater, Atwater learns from Gingrich as much as Gingrich learns from Atwater, it feels like. True. So GoPack's actually created in the early 80s and Gingrich takes it over from uh, DuPont uh, in 1984. It's a defunct organization and Gingrich turns it into a real important part of his platform. It's basically a way to communicate with other Republicans, candidates. He sends out uh, videos. He sends out memos about what to say, what to do in front of the media. And when he starts teaming up with Frank Luntz, they start really perfecting uh, uh, suggestions about rhetoric. And, and just as a taste, they, they let one out in 1990, which goes to Republican candidates running in the midterms. And the memo, it's one of the most famous. It's called Language, a Key Mechanism of Control. And it says, if, if you're a Republican who thinks, I wish I could speak like Newt, they say you have to use the following words to talk about Democrats. Corruption, traitors, sick, radical, shame, pathetic, steal, and lie. Uh, and, and that's a flavor of, of what he did with this. And ultimately, GOPAC will bring him uh, into ethical trouble um, because he uses it for his own campaign. He becomes the first speaker in American history who is uh, reprimanded and fined for ethics violations, ironically enough. Um, the talk radio is also important. He's at the forefront of talk radio and it's just growing. Uh, important to remember, he precedes really the growth of conservative talk radio. And a lot of what you hear on the airwaves is very Gingrich-like, uh, but when he's speaker in 94 and 95, he works closely with Rush, and, and they actually focus on messaging and themes of the day, and the Republican leadership and, and a lot of conservative talk radio hosts work hand in hand in a way which we see with uh, Fox News all the time. Uh, but, you know, uh, Lee Atwater finally uh, is also part of this same world. And, and one moment in my story is 1988, when George H.W. Bush is starting his campaign. He's the epitome of the old guard civil Republican. But Lee Atwater, who's a South Carolin Carolinian, really fierce campaigner who, who loves wrestling and thinks politics is like wrestling, he starts to introduce Gingrich's attacks on Jim Wright into the campaign. And Bush starts to talk about them before much of Washington thinks this is acceptable. Um, and, and the Atwater-Gingrich relation is about how the party leaders and the maverick political bomb throwers, you know, merged together by 1988 and 1989. So all of this is a huge infrastructure of Republican politics, the media, the campaigns, the congressional politics that I think really created the foundation of the current presidency. Um, and, and you, you do open the book up, uh, with, um, uh, Gingrich being essentially vetted, uh, for the, uh, vice presidency. Um, I, I just want to touch also on this, on the, uh, on the, on the contract for America, because, um, that was a document there, you know, there's a, I, I'm seeing this like as a strategy now, and I, it really becomes clear, uh, to me in the context of the Lincoln project, actually, you know, you see like the Lincoln project is out there doing these ads. They're the never Trumpers. They're Republicans who are, or, you know, are, are espousing, uh, you know, telling uh, Republicans not to vote for, uh, for, uh, for Trump, but rather vote for Biden. I am very skeptical as to their efficacy in terms of changing anybody's minds for votes, but they seem to be very effective in making it seem like they're changing people's minds for votes and that 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 the the value of what they're doing to them 
has more to do after the fact so that they can claim part of the mandate uh, if Joe Biden gets one. And it feels like that's what the contract of America for America or with America was about, too. That came in late. Nobody voted. Nobody came and pulled the le lever uh, for Republicans because of the contract for America. I had barely people were even aware of it before the election, were they? No, it was it was really a campaign ploy. It, it was done at the end. I think it was really targeting the media rather than the voters. Uh, I mean, it, look, it, it was it was distributed. This is a contract which listed a, a set of principles Republicans promised to put into place if they won. It was a way to almost nationalize the election and compete with Bill Clinton. Um, and it was put out in TV guide, and it was a tear out sheet that voters uh, were able to um, uh, put on their refrigerator as a reminder uh, for what Republicans would do. But the real target were reporters. It was a way to get attention for what Republicans were about, to get coverage of this story. They appear on Capitol Hill with the contract of America uh, and, and get some uh, good stories out of that. And I think that's ultimately what it was. None of it ever comes into being. Uh, and so once again, um, I think it, it reflects some of the thinness of some of the promises that are made in this era. All right. So talk about his uh, his uh, Gingrich's ultimate fall. He is really just disliked by a lot of people. And when he becomes less effective, um, he's summarily booted. Yes. So uh, he leads the impeachment against Bill Clinton. The House is getting ready to vote on the impeachment, which revolves around Clinton's uh, affair and with we should, Monica Lewinsky. We should also say and, it's necessary yeah. to say that Newt Gingrich not necessarily the guy you would imagine who is best suited to carry a message of you shouldn't lie about sex. Well, that's what happens. I mean, in the 98 midterms, which take place right before the vote, the Republicans do poorly. So they're already angry with him because he's not delivering the numbers he's promising on the Hill. But second, he's having an affair. And here's the leader of the party going after the president who's himself. And this wasn't the first. Uh, so he didn't embody at all the mm -hmm. values that the party was espousing, and the party couldn't afford that anymore. In fact, the person who's first going to replace Newt Gingrich is Robert Livingston of Louisiana, who voluntarily steps down from this job before he gets it, because he's also in a relationship. And then, of course, the next speaker is Denny Hafter, uh, mm -hmm. whose, whose family values are anything but, as, as we know from his faith. Right. Yeah. The guy was a pedophile uh, and was, yeah. was preying on, um, on, on, on wrestlers. Um, I mean, I, I, yeah, he was a coach. He was a wrestling coach. I don't know why, yeah. why that no, no. keeps coming up. And that's also seems to be a Republican theme. Uh, Jim Jordan at the very least um, didn't necessarily participate, but certainly as a coach was not uh, protecting his players. That's according to the players. I don't know if we could believe them, but I, I would imagine that many of them wouldn't lie about it, but um the uh, so uh, Gingrich uh, goes down in flames and then he just sort of maintains his grift for um, really through uh, the, the, you know, the Trump, uh, the beginning of Trump. He seems to have is he not around as much or am I just not watching as many right as much right wing TV? He has a he has a few years where he's not around as much uh, and he, he focuses on his consulting business and he makes a lot of money, but he does return. He returns first in that conservative world. He's a big presence on Fox television. He likes to present himself as the conservative intellectual um, and, and really takes on that role. But then he runs for president in 2012 and Kellyanne Conway actually helps run his campaign. Uh, and he starts the theme again of conservative populism. He goes after Mitt Romney for his work at Bain Capital, but he loses. And then he comes back a few years later as one of the vice presidential finalists for the Trump uh, ticket and ultimately loses out to Mike Pence. Um, so are we done with that era? I mean, do you think that like, I mean, because it does feel like Gingrich's influence, I, I mean, in terms of the, let's put it this way, like the Republican Party, I think, is still on a Gingrich trajectory, right? Where it's just like, 
the and I think you can see that both in terms of the elected officials, but you can see it with like the huge cadre of money that, that just flows into the right where it's there are no principles. It's just about, you know, winning on some effect and, and measured uh, either with clicks or views or book sales or, you know, uh, elections or uh, gerrymandering uh, or judges. Um, but it feels like the Democrats are exiting the Gingrich era before the Republicans are. Democrats definitely are. I think you see a, a true generational change that's happening in the party. Uh, in 2018 was the, the first time you really saw it play out in the electoral realm with Democrats who, in terms of their views, are just in a very different place than their predecessors. But many Democrats who've grown up watching this Gingrich Republican Party. And I think that's part of why they're very sensitive to the need to be a lot tougher and more sophisticated in competing with them. I don't know with Republicans. I mean, look, the, the person everyone's now talking about is the next uh, in line is Tucker Carlson. So that would suggest that the next generation might be just as committed to this one, uh, you know, for this form of politics. And I don't know. It's a shrinking party. It has a shrinking base. Uh, it has a president who's definitely not helping them expand it, but they still have things like the Electoral College. And I guess the question in 220, 224 is, uh, does this all finally come back to bite the party and do we enter a new era? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but, but I think what you're touching on is the big question for the GOP. All right. Lastly, let me ask you this. It's not related to the book, but you're a historian. Um, and I know you're not supposed to do this, but how are historians going to look at this era? Like, like, I mean, it, it just, are there eras that you look back in, in American history or, and just say, boy, those people, I mean, laughable must've been a nightmare being there, but they were, they were horrible. Like, I, where do you think we're going to fit in, in, in this, in that, in that, within that context, presuming, of course, that we can, you know, save civilization uh, from global climate change. Yeah, look, I, I think the period leading into the Civil War certainly is just one study after another uh, of failed leadership, of dysfunctional politics, uh, and of the inability of, of elected officials to uh, resolve the biggest problem of our time, slavery. Uh, now, I think it's going to be an era of just total dysfunction and breakdown. And I think as a historian, it, it's not going to be that we're looking at both parties the same way. That just would be inaccurate. I think the, one of the big puzzles will be starting with Donald Trump and looking backwards and saying, how did we get to this place? How did we get to a moment where this is what you see from the presidency and this is a party that is generally fine with that. And that's going to be one of the biggest questions, as well as the cost, the, the dysfunction that resulted from it, which we see playing out right now uh, in the pandemic. Well, I certainly hope they start with uh, Donald Trump, because if they start with Tom Cotton, we're in big, big trouble. Uh, <laughs> Julian Zalazer, the book is uh, Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of the Speaker, The Rise of the New Republican Party. We'll put a link at majority.fm. Thanks so much for joining us. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it as well. Bye-bye.